wonderful to see all of you. And um, this room is very familiar to me. It's a very comfortable place, virtually, and it brings back lots of good memories. I have to say that I remember the first conversation I had with Suhad that was on my back deck uh, in, in uh, Lower Gwynedd when uh, I found out about the sods coming. And we had the only information we had was a cousin named Suhad who was in the area reached out to her by phone and talked to her, talked to you. I remember that afternoon very clearly. I recall that very, very well. And then I remember the day that we went to visit Jamal when he was work after he had arrived and he was working. And we went to visit him at his, his first job there and got to meet him. So it's such a delight to see you both uh, there. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, uh, uh, I'll bring you up to date on the, the whereabouts of the Graftons, I suppose. Um, <laughs> so I am now uh, serving as the academic dean at what used to be called Hartford Seminary in Hartford, Connecticut. It is now Hartford International University. It used to be a United Church of Christ Seminary, but it is now an um, interfaith um, university that offers a number of master's programs and a PhD program. But enough about me. You want to know about my family. That's more important, I think. So, <laughs> um, Carla is uh, currently working as the librarian at a, United, uh, at a Congregationalist church in West Hartford. If you can believe it, this uh, first church in West Hartford has an endowed public library. Wow. So somebody somebody bequeathed money to the church, and they um, opened up a library, and they do um, focus on peace and justice um, issues and spirituality. So they've been very much in um, providing resources for pastors during um, the last couple of years uh, in uh, racism and anti-racism work. Um, so she's happy doing that. Um, Andrew, our oldest. Um, is uh, now married, got married last July 4th weekend um, to a young woman of Iranian descent, Fatima, and they live in um, Boston. Andrew is graduating this May, master's in international um, relations and diplomacy, focusing on, um, if you can believe it or not, um, interspace policy. Huh. Wow. Never knew that even existed. Yeah, well, it didn't up until a couple of years ago. <laughs> so he's coming in at the right time. He's quite yeah. excited. Um, Rebecca is living in Washington, D.C. She works for an organization called um, IUDA, which provides um, a number of services to immigrants and refugees. And her area is in providing language resources and translation resources for um, immigrants. And then Dan is just graduated from the University of Michigan last May yeah. and began freaking out about what to do with life in general and landed a job at an architecture firm in Chicago. Wow. wow. Living the best life in downtown Chicago and just got a dog. <laughs> Good. So the Graftons are, are, are doing well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. Why, why, why don't we begin in prayer and then I'll, introduce you to the topic for the next couple of weeks. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for this gathering morning that we might come together physically or virtually across time and space. We ask that you would bless our time together as we think and learn about Jesus in a variety of different ways. It help us to think more clearly about our own relationship with God and how we view Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, so um, we're going to spend the next three weeks uh, looking at uh, Jesus or Isa in Islam. And each particular week can be done independently. I think if you miss a week and come back, you won't be any worse for the wear. Each particular um, session can stand on its own. 
I do have, I did provide a number of handouts. Of course, you know, I'm a, I'm a professor. Uh, and so this is, we have to justify ourselves. So I provide handouts. Um, so there's a resources handout for congregations that has books, um, online resources, both Christian resources and Muslim resources. And um, one thing I noticed I neglected to put in there were my recommendations for English translations of the Quran, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. But nevertheless, I think that's plenty of for you to read in the next week. So when you come back next week, <laughs> we'll, we'll see how you do. <laughs> yeah, right. <thanks. laughs> um, as always, um, when I begin speaking and, and introducing things, if I say something that doesn't make sense or you're confused about, please just raise your hand and we can stop and, and see if I could clarify this. Um, I find that I often have to do this with my family. They make me <laughs> clarify myself. So um, it's not unusual for me to, to do that. So um, we're going to look today at the handout on an overview of Jesus in Islam. And I want to say a few things by word of introduction. We're simply going to look at where Jesus, um, or as he's known in the Quran as Isa, where he, um, a number of prominent passages where he is portrayed in the Quran. Um, but I want to start out by talking a little bit about terminology and the Quran. So first and foremost, it's important to know that the Quran, which is the, the, the holy book for Muslims, um, is not really uh, put together like our Bible. So our Bible uh, that's sitting in front of you, you're all good Lutherans, so you, you, you have your Bibles, I see. So our Bible is put together from Genesis to Revelation, right? From the beginning of creation to the end of creation. And there's a narrative structure that fits for the Bible. And in many places, specifically in the Gospels, we have a narrative about the life of Jesus. So when we look at our Bibles and begin reading our Bibles, we're particularly, at least I should speak for myself, I'm attuned to coming at this to read a narrative, a story about any number of things, either Jesus or Abraham, or um, David, or Paul in Acts, for example. These are stories and narratives, right? And um, even though the particular books of the Bible may, be, may have been written at different times, the books of the Bible are put together in some kind of historical framework. That's not the case for the Quran. The Quran is put together in a way in which God only knows the reason why it was put together in such a way. In fact, it says God knows what is best. Um, it's 114 chapters or revelations that were given in various time frames from God through the angel Gabriel to the prophet Muhammad. And then Muhammad then recited these revelations to um, his companions, and later they wrote it down. Now, these revelations were given during his lifetime by God, and they speak to particular moments during his life. But they're not a, so much a narrative like we have. They're more like if you open up to the Psalms or the Proverbs in the Bible. When you read a Psalm, you have in front of you poetry or a particular reference to something that might be obscure. The Psalms don't tell you, for the most part, the larger picture or historical framework of the Psalm. It's just a Psalm, right? And so you assume lots of things. Let's say, for example, Psalm 51, Psalm of David. We assume that this is written by David about his life, but we don't know that. The psalm doesn't tell us that. We just infer that from other things we've read in the Bible. Or the Proverbs. When you read through the Proverbs, they just give you these pithy sayings. They don't tell you when the sayings were 
attributed and to whom. It's just all poetry. So if you think about the Quran in that regard, it might be more helpful. The other thing to note about the Quran is that unlike the Bible that was put together over thousands of years by a number of different people who were authors of the books, the Quran came together in a very short period of time. We normally think about the revelations beginning during Muhammad's life in about 610. And then over 22 years, the revelations came to him until his death. So only 22 years, 21, 22 years to one person. And then within a matter of about another 20 years, 25 years, his followers had compiled them and put them together into what we now know as the Mus'haf or the, the compilation of the Quran. So it was put together in a very short period of time and it was provided by only one person. Whereas our Bible was written over thousands of years and put together by a variety of different people. So I say this by way of introduction because even though they are both holy books or books that we read, Jews, and, Jews read the Tanakh or the Hebrew Bible, Christians read the Bible that includes the Old Testament and the New Testament, and Muslims read the Quran, we read them for very different reasons and in very different ways. Although Muslims who will begin uh, the month of Ramadan coming up will read sections of the Quran all the way through the month of Ramadan in sections. During, their, during the um, rest of the year, they will read bits and pieces of it for prayers, but not necessarily um, as, a, as a narrative like we do when we read our lectionary. So we go through the Gospels, for example, we read the life of Jesus as a lectionary. I'll talk more about the Gospels next week because it's important to understand where those stories fit into the Islamic literature. Let me just stop here and see if there are any questions about the Quran before we start looking at some of the passages. I have a question, David, as you would expect. <laughs> yes. Um, you referred to revolutions for the Quran. Uh, why that word? Yeah, so for Muslims, um, God spoke, and that speech came down to Muhammad. It's called Tanzil. It comes down to Muhammad, and Muhammad experienced this oral recitation by God. And that is what, for Muslims in, in Orthodox Islam, what Muslims see as revelation, God's literal speech. Um, so when we think in the book of Exodus, where Moses is on Mount Sinai, and God speaks to Moses and provides the Ten Commandments and the law, that's more akin to what Muslims, how Muslims have understood uh, revelation, God's literal speech. Thank you. Yes, Suhad. I, I wonder how common is it for people to uh, memorize the Quran? Oh, yes. In fact, that is the primary way historically mo Muslims have uh, engaged with the by memory, that you learn it by memory. Um, it, it, although it's hard work, <laughs> I don't know if Jamal and Suhad have our muhafiz, if they've memorized it all, but certainly they would have memorized many different passages from the Quran because that's the primary way that you engage with it as a Muslim rather than reading it. And certainly for us as Christians, um, when we're, we're used to opening the Bible and saying, you know, go to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 13, you know, and that's how we find our place. Um, for Muslims, that really has not been the way you engage the Quran. You would just recite a passage because you have memorized it. And you might know what chapter or surah it's from, but it, it historically has not had verse numbers or chapter numbers. You would just recite it. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, can I answer him, please, first? Yes, please. Yeah, uh, we start memorizing the Quran when we are kids. They start with us in elementary school, and sometimes before that at home, the people, there are very small verses, like mm -hmm. one line or two lines. They start with that as children, 
and then we continue until we finish high school. So, but it doesn't have to be the whole Quran, it's too much, yeah. but yeah. <laughs> People who will memorize the whole Quran, they are like scholars, they go to a certain university to do that. Better to memorize as a young person than a... <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. still yeah. have a memory. Uh, and we, memorize, we have to memorize some of it because in the prayers, we don't read in the book. In prayers, we have to recite right. it uh, by our hearts. We right. have to learn yeah. it by our hearts. Okay. Right. How long is it, like compared to like the Bible, is it? It's uh, 604 pages and of, could be of this size. Yeah, yeah it'll be about the same. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's, this is maybe more. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's, yeah, it's the small too. The print is yeah. small, yeah. There yeah, text, textually it's about, it's a little shorter than the New Testament. <clears throat> but usually when you see a Quran, it's big. It's because the, the translation has all kinds of um, uh notes and interpretation with it but but textually it's the arabic is about a little bit shorter than the testament itself six thousand six hundred and sixteen verses i believe <laughs> yes too high yeah i want to just to say the difference between uh, god spoke to isa and to muhammad uh, mm -hmm. uh, God personally spoke to Isa direct, uh, I mean to Musa, uh, to Musa directly, he spoke to him. But to Muhammad, uh, the Quran was revealed, revealed through uh, Gabriel, uh, not directly. Uh, God never spoke directly to Muhammad. Gabriel. Right. Sorry. Yeah, I was using the example of an where God speaks, uh, where, where God speaks to Moses giving the law, right? Right, yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah, Gabriel, the messenger, um, speaks, is, is God's messenger. And so in most cases, uh, that's how revelation comes, from from God to Gabriel down and then to to Muhammad or, or the other prophets. Um, now, I, I want to um, say a few words about terms because it's important for Christians, and I hope this will be helpful for you in your own faith to help you think a little bit about the terms that we use regularly in church, but may not really think about them all that much. And that is, um, you'll, you'll find in the Quran, when reading about Jesus or Isa, there are a number of common terms used, but they mean, in some cases, slightly different things, or in other cases, very different things. You'll find the term Injil or gospel. The term gospel is used regularly in Islamic literature, but it means something slightly different than what we mean as Christians. You'll hear the term um, uh, Messiah or the term spirit of God or word of God. I want you to pay attention to that as we go through this today because the Quran uses a slightly different reference than we do. Nevertheless, I hope it's helpful for you as you think about how you understand these particular terms. Okay? Now, let's start out at the very beginning um, of Jesus or Isa in the Quran. Je Jesus, and I'm going to use the term Jesus rather than Isa here simply because that's what you are used to hearing. And I think that's more helpful or common for you. So in the Quran, generally, Jesus is a prophet. And as a prophet, a particular kind of prophet, he was granted a revelation. God spoke a revelation to him and gave him the gospel, which is now some kind of scripture or book. The Quran talks about how there are a number of different scriptures that were given to the prophets. So Moses was given the Torah or the law. David was given the Zabur or the Psalms. Jesus was given the gospel. And Muhammad was um, revealed the Quran or the last revelation, which is now in uh, a book form. So when we think about revelation, in historically in Islamic thought, re revelation is that which comes from God down and then is compiled into some kind of scripture or book form given by these particular prophets, 
that we know of in, in our Bible. Okay? So let's keep that in mind. Hello, Pastor Keith. Hey, David. Hi. We miss you. Hi there. Yeah. I'm glad you're checking up on me and, and making sure I'm not spouting heresy here. <laughs> Great to see you. Give, a, give our love to everybody, okay? Thank you. Thanks Thank you. Here. All right. So let's take this first passage or ayat from the Quran that sums up, I think, who Jesus is for Muslims in the Quran. Could somebody read this paragraph that says, that starts with Jesus spoke? I'll do it. I am the servant of God. He has given me the book and ordained me a prophet. His blessing is upon me wherever I go, and he has exhorted me to be steadfast in prayer and to give alms as long as I shall live. He has exhorted me to honor my mother and has purged me of vanity and wickedness. Blessed was I on the day I was born, and blessed I shall be on the day of my death and on the day I shall be raised to life. Okay, thank you. So this is a particular passage that Jesus speaks, um, and it's part of the birth narrative of Jesus and, and Mary's role in the birth of Jesus. This encapsulates, for me, how, how the Quran or understands who Jesus is and Jesus' role in many different forms. What jumps out at you or what do you see here uh, as particular characteristics of Jesus? Death and resurrection. Well, is it resurrection? Raised. Raised to life. Right. Raised to life. So hold, keep that particular passage in mind when we get to talking about the crucifixion. Because for Muslims... Um, this is a passage that's also said um, by John, the prophet John, blessed be me on the day of my birth and my death. And for so it's not unusual that prophets would say this, but in Islamic thought in the Quran, Jesus never died, but was ascended into heaven. And so for many Muslims, Jesus is still alive in heaven and will come back at the end of time. Um, but just never died and re was resurrected. So that's important for us to think about say when we see again. these kinds of events. Say that again, David. Say that again. Say yeah, that. So, so for Muslims in the Quran, Jesus never died. He, was, he, he didn't, was not crucified to death and then resurrected to life. But rather, he has, before he died, was taken up by God into heaven. So much like in the Old Testament, we read about Elijah, who was taken up into heaven, right? There's the story of Elijah and Elisha, and Elijah was taken up into heaven on the chariots of fire. Much like that, Jesus in the Quran ascends into heaven. And so um, for Muslims, for many Muslims, he will come back at the end of time during the judgment day, to help with the judgment day. And for some Muslims, Jesus will descend during the judgment day in Damascus. There's a particular mosque and minaret, Damascus, that some Muslims think he will come back from. So when we read, I shall be raised to life, for Muslims there, it is a reference to Jesus' ascension into heaven rather than his resurrection. Hmm. This is why I say when we see these references, we need to not assume our own particular uh, background and uh, assumption about what it means. Yes, Sally. I'm interested in your thoughts about the Holy Spirit, the, the Spirit of God through Jesus. And Yeah, if you can hold on to that question, we'll come to that in the very next passage. Okay. As a good student, you're always steps ahead of the instructor. Uh, David, you have another question from Carol. From Carol. Oh. Hi, Carol. Um, 
what I'm looking at here is um, Jesus saying that I am the servant of God, but we are used to hearing him say I'm the son of God. Very good. Yes. So um, you will never you will never see in the Quran or with Muslims the claim that Jesus is the son of God. Jesus, as we will see in a minute, is the son of Mary, is the son of Mary. Now, think about this for a minute. If in the Quran, Jesus is referenced regularly and most often as Isa ibn Miriam or Jesus, the son of Mary, what does that seem to indicate or assume or apply in the Quran? If that is the most common reference, Jesus, son of Mary. Human. He's human, right, that he's human. He is a special human, born of the Virgin Mary, but he is human. And so, as we will see in a minute when we talk about the divinity of Jesus, this is a big difference between um, Muslim and Christian thinking about who Jesus is as divine or human. Well, that was a very good insight. Yeah, Bill. Um, so do Muslims believe that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary? Yep. Okay. Yes. Okay. So you'll see I, to me, I think they, this is just me and probably only me that, they, <laughs> that in terms of the divinity of Jesus, they leave it as an open question because it says very clearly, uh, that, um, well, okay, this is an inference. Uh, it doesn't say he was born of Mary and Joseph. It just says he's born of Mary. And it says, uh, uh, he has exhorted me to honor my mother. There's no mention of the father, <laughs> which is a man I think personal. <laughs> um, so I think they, this is me, this is my spin on it. They, they leave that deity question is kind of open, um, which I think allows some wiggle room. <laughs> well, you're right. There is no mention of Joseph here, and um, that's in other traditions. But when you read the, if you go further down, uh, point number three, the verse, there's a ver there is a narrative here about Jesus' birth, and it's very clear that God is the one who creates the miracle of Jesus being born by the Virgin Mary. Um, so um, there, are, there are lots of people out in the world who esteem Jesus very highly and might even accept that Jesus was born miraculously. Muslims being one, Hindus being other, and some Buddhists. But they, outside of the Christian faith, would not equate the miraculous birth with Jesus being divine. So I think that is something important for us as Christians to think about, because we usually equate the two, that the virgin birth is proof that Jesus is divine. And the Quran is very clear about this. If God can create Adam out of nothing with no parents, then why cannot God create Jesus out of one parent, Mary? Right? Wow. There's, a, there's a logic there <laughs> that God can do anything God wants. Kun He and it is. God creates out of nothing. So for me, this is always, I think, interesting to help me rethink what does the virgin birth signify for Christians if it doesn't sit necessarily signify the divinity of Jesus for anyone else. I'll leave that with you to think about. What else do you see here in the paragraph about the particular personalities or characteristics of Jesus? I noticed prayer and giving alms stood out to me. Yeah. So he's, yeah, he's noted as being very prayerful and giving alms or giving to the poor. And so as we'll see 
in the next two weeks, some of the traditions about Jesus focus on his, his prayer, prayer life, constantly in prayer to God, constantly giving and, uh, to the poor or healing the poor. That's one of his roles as a prophet. What else? Um, his, uh, he seems perfect. I mean, he's, he's, uh, he has no vanity or wickedness. You know, he's, <clears throat> he's perfect. You know, and he loves his mother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, from the Muslim point of view, again, only God is perfect. So although the prophets are um, important, they're still human. And in some traditions, in especially the Shi tradition, the prophets are sinless. But that's not always the case in other, other uh, perspectives. Uh, of Islam. I, I, you, you talk about other prophets. I thought Muhammad was the only prophet. Oh, no. no. There are many prophets. Let, let Suhad or Jamal can, can talk about the many prophets. Oh, yes. yeah. Uh, we start with uh, Abraham. Adam, Abraham, uh, Adam. Uh, Noah, no, 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 prophets, yeah. Jonah, oh, uh, uh, Jesus, Moses, and Muhammad, Isaac, uh, 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 yeah, Ismail, okay. Uh, what else? Are you? Are you job? Job. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah.
Ibn Miriam. These specific titles to Jesus are only given to him alone. And remember, while we as Christians might latch on to particular words from our own assumptions, the Quran uses them slight, in slightly different ways. So let's read this next passage, which has all of these terms in them, and we can begin looking at that. Can somebody read the next passage? Emily, would you do that, please? Oh, sure. People of the book, do not transgress the bounds of your religion. Speak nothing but the truth about God. The Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, was no more than God's apostle and his word which he cast to Mary, a spirit from him. So believe in God and his apostles and do not say, three, forbear and it shall be better for you. God is but one God. God forbid that he should have a son. His is all that the heavens and the earth contain. God is the all-sufficient protector. The Messiah does not disdain to be a servant of God, nor do the angels who are nearest to him. Those who through arrogance disdain his service shall all be brought before him. Okay. So in this passage, we find a number of these titles for Jesus, including the Messiah, um, Son of Mary, Apostle, Word, Spirit, Servant. These are all positive terms and important terms that signify Jesus' important role in the Quran. Now, it begins, this passage begins with the phrase, people of the book, people of the book. Ahl Kitab. Who are the people of the book? The Muslims. Jews, the Israelites. Jews. Muslims. <laughs> or? Everybody. Christians? Christians. Christians. <laughs> Christians. All of the above. It's talking to us. Talking to us. Al Kitab. In this case, people of the book. Why? Because it, the Quran recognizes that Christians have a book and that book is called the what? I mentioned it earlier. The Bible? The Bible? No. Oh, Suhan knows. Yeah, Suhan, you know. I, I, sorry, I wasn't listening. We were... Oh. <laughs> I was busy trying to figure out the numbers that you put at the end because I'm trying to uh, find it in Arabic in the Quran. So sorry about that. searching. I'm sorry. Yeah. This is what I say, that the passages here are given for non-Muslim English readers to find their way, not Muslims who know Arabic. <laughs> is it the gospel? Yes, the gospel. Right. Remember, the gospel, um, the gospel is a, a book, not the story of the life of Jesus. Oh. So... Um, by the way, Suhad, I'm sorry, I never answered your question. It's Nisa and Nisa, Surah and Nisa. So, surah uh, number four, yes. referring to uh -huh. the Surah? Okay. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you so much. Right. <laughs> so, yes, for Muslims in the Quran, the gospel is the book. It's the revelation that's given to Jesus. For us as Christians, we think of the gospel or the term gospel in three ways, right? As Lutherans. We think about the gospel as the good news of Jesus, the life of Jesus. We think about the gospels as the written gospels, the canonical gospels in the Bible. And we also think about the preached word, the gospel, meaning the forgiveness of sin, the preached word that's given to us. But for Muslims, the gospel is a book that was given to Jesus that is then given to Christians to live their life by. We are to live our lives by the gospel. That's what it means here, okay? So Christians are people of the book. You all have books in front of you. We're people of the Bible. And there's a positive reference there to who we are as people. Now, what does it mean when it says Jesus is the Messiah? How can the Quran refer to Jesus as the Messiah? 
Jesus, he was anointed. Uh, he was anointed with a particular job to do, kind of like a king. Yeah. It has nothing to do with his uh, particular role of dying and rising for our sins, but for his being anointed or set aside for a particular role. The Quran does not um, specify what the Messiah is. Muslim commentators throughout history have debated what this term means. So even Muslim scholars are not sure specifically what El Masih stands for, other than Jesus is set aside for a particular task. Now, let's look at two other very important terms that are mentioned here that gets back to Sally's point or Sally's question, that Jesus is God's word and a spirit. Now, what does God's word and spirit mean to us as Christians? That, that Jesus is came to us for us to make a direct connection to God through him. Jesus was showing us how to live uh, by his word, his, his example. But I don't know spirit. spirit. Well, John 1.1 1, 1 says that the word, God was the word. So the word is God. That Jesus as the word is God. And the, the spirit I'm stumped. <laughs> Somebody else. You're, on, you're on the right path. You're absolutely correct. So for us as Christians, I too, Bill, automatically go to John 1.1, 1, 1, right? And the word was God and the word was with God, right? For us, there's a connection between Jesus as the, the word of God as part of God's essence, part of God, right? Yep. That's where we go. Now, um, what Vicky said a moment ago about that Jesus comes to show us the way to live our lives, and um, er, as was, was earlier said, as an example, would Muslims disagree with that? Would, they not? would Muslims disagree with the fact that Jesus comes to show us how to live our lives? No, no, no. No, of course not. Because he that's what he does, right? He comes to show us as a prophet yeah. a way to live and remember God. But would Muslims equate that with God itself? No. No. Oh, no, right, exactly. So that's where the difference is. Okay. So with this, I'm going to have us jump, turn the page over. And we're gonna because we only have 10 more minutes left, so you have to get everything in in Islamic thought and theology and the Quran in the last 10 minutes. I want us to look at number four, the denial of divinity, because this is where we often are speaking not in the same language as with Muslims. So there are two passages here. And I would like someone to read the first one from 39.4 and then um, 4.171. And again, for uh, Suhad, this is Surah Zumar and uh, El Nisa. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Harold, would you do both of them, please? Sure. Had it been God's will to adopt, take a son, he would have chosen whom he pleased out of his own creation. But God forbid, he is God, the one, the Almighty. People of the book, do not transgress the bounds of your religion. Speak nothing but the truth about God. 
the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, was no more than God's apostle, and his word which he cast to Mary, a spirit from him. So believe in God and his apostles, and do not say three. <laughs> okay, that sums it up very clearly here in the Quran about what the Quran says to people of the book, in case Christians, right? That Jesus, as a prophet, is God's word and God's spirit or a spirit from God and an apostle, but not God, not the essence of God. Jesus is all of these things, but not God, right? Yes, Vicki. What? So in the Quran, do, does it talk about us? It said the people of the book, it says, so it's talking about. Yes. 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 Yeah. Oh, yes. In many places, yeah. And oh, know. yes. There are many. Yeah. So there are many. An argument against Christianity. There are all kinds of passages that talk about the people of the book, Al Kitab, about and the Sara or the Christians or followers of Jesus, and even the monks or the priests of Christianity. And some of the passages are very positive about the monks who continually pray to God and about some of the Christians who are very good. But there are other passages that talk about the Christians in this case and challenge us. Now, think about how in the New Testament, specifically the Gospel of John, the Jews are referenced. The Jews are referenced many times in the Gospels. And in many cases, they're not referenced very well. In fact, in the Gospel of John, there are some very, very difficult passages about Jews there. So in my own education in, learn, in reading through the Quran, where these particular passages about Christians come up, it has always challenged me to go back and reread passages in the Gospels that refer to the Jews, because now I'm in a different situation, right? I have heard how someone else looks at me, so now I cannot but help to look at the Jews or Judaism in a similar way of how my text is talking about them in challenging terms. And my perspective, I think this is very helpful, a very good spiritual practice. Yes. Um, what is the time? I guess the Judaism is the oldest religion and then Christianity and, and then Muslim. Is that? Is that yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we normally think, of, well, Judaism as we know it did not come into existence until about the time of Jesus. So it's about Jesus' time because he's a rabbi. So rabbinical Judaism comes, comes about the time of Jesus. But it begins time of Abraham, so 1, 1,200 years earlier. So the Hebrew Bible and Judaism is earlier than Christianity in about the first century, and then Islam, or at least Muhammad comes, and Muhammad, the Quran is revealed in the 6th or 7th century. So you can think about that historical progression of communities. So David, now, on, yes. on that issue of the divinity or that question, the divinity of Jesus, the Muslims and the Jews would be in agreement. Absolutely. Absolutely. So there are Judaism and Islam share many, many more commonalities than Judaism and Christianity. That's interesting. Yeah. We often, in our North American country, we often think of Judeo-Christian tradition. In actuality, Islam and Judaism have much more in common. They're, the religious systems are set up where you have religious scholars, rabbis, ulama, or alim, who are the, the scholars are the ones for helping people to learn how to live their life. Whereas for Christianity, it's been priests, bishops, pastors, who are all involved in some kind of sacramental life of the church. 
So this is something to leave you with, is to think about the fact that actually Christianity, the outlier here when it comes to the Abrahamic traditions, that Judaism and Islam are much, much more closely attuned. They ask very similar questions, much more so than Christians do. For example, for Jews and Muslims, often the question is, can I eat this food or not? Is this food allowable for me? Whereas Christians, okay. we usually have not, at least Protestants, we usually have not had those. <laughs> we don't really care, right? <laughs> now, there are scriptural, theological reasons for that. But the questions that Muslims have asked over time have been very similar. Muslims will go to a scholar to ask a question about marriage, inheritance, taxes. Jews will go to their rabbis to ask questions about marriage, birth, etc. All kinds of things. Christians normally don't ask those particular kinds of questions, at least not in, in our tradition. Let me close with the final challenge to us as Christians, and that is the final part of the um, story here. So believe in God and his apostles and do not say three. What is What can we assume in reference to three? Trinity. The Trinity. The Trinity. The Trinity. Now, um, in my experience as both a student of Christianity and a student of Islam, and as a professor, I have found this particular challenge, it comes up in two places in the Quran, this particular challenge from the Quran about the Trinity, or at least articulating God as three, to be one of the most helpful things that has helped me articulate and think about what do I mean when I talk about God as the triune God? Because from the Quranic perspective, there is only one. And God is over and above all things. And if it's one thing that the Quran speaks against, it is polytheism other gods yeah. it's it tells people to not worship other gods but only the one god this is the same thing that we find in the hebrew bible the prophets in the hebrew bible are always exhorting the israelite to worship god alone and not other gods so again this regard judaism islam are very clear that obedience and love goes to God alone and not other gods. The moment that Christians begin to use the language of three or triune, what does it sound like, Jews and Muslims? Polytheism. 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 Yeah. It sounds like we're worshiping gods. But as far as I understand my faith, that is not the case. So, I leave you with this homework. <laughs> it is your job to go home and then figure out how is it that God can be three and one? <laughs> how is it that there is only one God and yet we talk about God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? And what do we as Christians mean by that? Because I guarantee you, it is not only Muslims, but it is Jews, it is Buddhists, it is atheists, it is agnostics, who all ask that same question of Christians. <laughs> How is it that you say you believe in God, but you believe in the Trinity? Thank you. Oh, boy. <laughs> Wow. All right. Yeah. That's your homework. Figure it out. Good luck.
question for you from our Bible study. Well, for those people who need to go, thank you for being here. If I see you next week, that would be great. Otherwise, have a good Lent. Thank you, David. Thank you. This was great. We want to know. All right, somebody else say this. Ishmael's his sons, he, he was the beginning of the Muslim religion, or Islam religion, correct? Where, where no. No? What? Talk to me. <laughs> okay. What, so, what happened to his children? I mean, where were yeah, they? Yeah. Right. So there is, um, in Islamic literature, um, Muhammad traces his lineage back to Ishmael. Okay. He is part of the tribe of Ishmael. Okay. But Muslims are, is anyone who would submit God. So there are all kinds of Muslims, even at the time of Muhammad, who were not from the tribe of Ishmael. They weren't from his tribe. They may have been Persians. They may have been Ethiopians. They may have even been Jews, but they converted Islam to become Muslims. So Muslims would never say we are we are descendants of Ishmael, because Ishmael is a particular ethnic historical lineage that only, that Muhammad was descended from. But people would say we Muslims. Maybe I'll I'll let Suhad and Jamal speak for themselves. But Muslims would say. We are spiritual descendants of Abraham, the prophet, but not necessarily Ishmael, because Ishmael is just one of the many different prophets in Islam. The, the, the idea that Muslims from Ishmael is a particular Christian reading that's not even necessarily a biblical. It's just a historical narrative that we've given so, so the Islam did not start until Muhammad. That's when the rich religion started. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's it. Yeah, sixth century. All right. So, yeah, I mean, so Jamal and Suhad, I mean, you wouldn't consider yourselves followers of Ishmael, you? No. No. Yeah. Right. Followers of Ishmael. No. Uh, no. No. Yeah. Nor even descendants, right? Uh, right. right. No, it's just he was a prophet. And yeah. Jim, yeah. Jim, thank you. Bye bye. Well, thank you. Thank okay. you. Uh, thank you. Good to see you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That's very good seeing you. Say hi to all, all the family. Beautiful. Say hi. Say hi to everybody. <laughs>